Hello and welcome to the Healthy Business Leader Show. I couldn't tell you which episode it is. I think it's maybe 19, maybe 20. It's around there anyway. And um, I'm really, really pleased to welcome Ryan Musselman. Thank you for coming on to the uh, show. Really appreciate it. And um, just a very brief introduction, you know, business coach to solopreneurs and also the owner of Parade Studios. I often do a kind of a poor job of introducing people. So do you want to quickly introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do and who you work with? That'd be great. I think you nailed the introduction, man. It's that simple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm a business coach for solopreneurs, dominantly coaches who are launching or have launched a coaching business need to monetize it better on LinkedIn. So we help fix the offer and we help fix the content that promotes the offer. And then we help fix the sales process that sells the offer. So we get it all working in a compounding fashion. Okay. Anyone that spends 30 seconds on LinkedIn will see Ryan pop up quite regularly. He's got, <laughs> he's got quite a few followers and he's very active. So, so just so I, you know, I had a little look through the LinkedIn profile and done my, my due diligence, right? So you're back, you've got a good, kind of long background in content creation, right? Yeah, I've been doing content business for about 16 years or so, spent some time working at Google, managing large content enterprises, helped kind of lead and co-sell content companies, or at least they were a core function of, of their operation was content. So leading and selling those, and then just managing large teams and various executive roles throughout all the creator economy, really. You know, every, ever since video, in like 2010 started exploding on YouTube. That's kind of where my entry point was. So I've seen the business really transform trends that have skyrocketed and then fell off. So uh, it's a fascinating environment, very volatile, but at the same time, very <laughs> opportunistic. Yeah, I mean, uh, I've not got the rich history that you have in the content space. But I mean, LinkedIn for us has been massive over the last couple of years, Great. Uh, having access to, you know, such amazing people, meeting people like yourself, you know, from a non-business perspective, but also, you know, meeting potential clients has been has been great for us. So, I mean, for, from your side of things, just give us a bit of insight into what you've seen change over the last 10 years in this space. Yeah, you know, when I started my, my career in this, I was at a startup in LA that was recruiting YouTubers who were producing video game content. And the idea there was that we could be the MTV for the video game generation. And so we would recruit a bunch of content creators and we'd get access to their video inventory, which had just millions and millions of impressions. And so we would package it and go and try to sell it to large sponsorships and sell media packages. So that was the kind of first foray that I saw into this wide world of social media and building a quote unquote online business. And it only progressed further with the Twitters of the world, the Facebooks, even though Facebook and Twitter were already on the scene at the time, but yeah. they all kind of adapted their business model in some degree to that creator economy side of it. So video just continues to be the most important trend. I mean, look at TikTok, right? You've seen the headlines of people mm -hmm. saying, or I guess, I, you know, I don't know how do we verify this claim, right? I think the data was, was kind of saying that TikTok searches were at some point getting more than Google searches or than the homepage of Google. I, wow. I, you know, how was that accurate and, and how was that measured? We'd have to probably look a little bit deeper into, but the younger generations are using less Google to search and more searching on TikTok. And that's everything from like tax information to recipes, to restaurants, to entertainment, you name it. And so just seeing how social media continues to be the center of the way we communicate, but also the way we buy and the way we sell and the way we relate or build a business or stay connected and, and so on. And now LinkedIn has finally stepped into the space, although it's been a good three years since they enabled creator mode, but they're finally stepping into the space and saying, we care about people who create content and, um, you know, whether that's to be a thought leader or to build and sell something. So all of it coming together is a fascinating learning experience and um, continue to be excited about where it's going to go. Yeah, I mean, it, it's crazy, really, because this conversation, the timing of it is quite apt because I've seen a trend. Obviously, we're in the health and fitness space, right? And um, health and fitness has been pretty prevalent on social media from the from the get go, right? People training in gyms, people taking photos of their lunches, all this kind of stuff. What I've seen, and I don't know if, if you've kind of noticed this as well, 
specifically within the health and fitness space, there's kind of more and more of these influencer type people kind of get into the top, right? You know, the quote unquote top, which which means more followers, more engagement, right? Not necessarily giving the best information, but having extremely large following, very, very large engagement. What I've started to see is this trend where you're getting these kind of influencers on TikTok or Instagram, whatever it may be. And now they're kind of doing these live quarrels, these like arguments around, you know, calling each other out and saying, hey, this guy's chatting nonsense. You shouldn't be following this. And it kind of, for, for me, someone that's in the health and fitness space and runs a company called Truth, it's quite difficult because what I've started to see is a trend towards people in the space that should be focusing on really helping people getting into this world where actually they just quarrel in on social medias about what the correct process is, what's the right thing, you know, what, what everyone, everyone should be doing. And my, my issue with it is that the person that's trying to find the help, it's become so confusing to find information that's actually helpful for you. And it's for me, it's, it's a worrying trend. I'm not sure where it ends up. I'm not sure where we go from here. And um, yeah, I'd be interested to get your insight into that, whether you've noticed it or it's something that's happened in other industries before. Yeah, there's always that social media beef, man. <laughs> is, I, and I think it comes from a deep place of a creator feeling threatened that their business model is going to slow down in, in some way. And uh, that's unfortunate, right? Like the, the beefing side of it doesn't help anyone. Hmm. Yes, it gets clicks. I get it. People love drama. Oh man, but, but does it have to be so messy? You know, does is it really <laughs> necessary? Can't we just do good work consistently yep. and, and, and move forward through that? So yeah, I've seen it. I know what you're talking about. That's interesting on the health side of it, where people are calling people out. Um, you've probably seen that more than I do. And I know man, the health industry is just it, like, this is the place for social media on it, right? Everyone's got a case study. Yeah. Everyone's got a scientific study. Yeah. And the recipe seems pretty rinse and repeat about how they're going to attract and convert clients. So I imagine people see one person doing it, feel threatened or feel something, whatever, or feel like they're ripping off their content and their style. And then it just leads to the beef. I, I'm, yeah. I'm only guessing, but that's kind of how I imagine it goes. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's been a couple, and I'm not going to mention any names at all. And I don't, I don't want to enter in the world of, you know, calling Good. people yeah, out. <laughs> yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to get into that because for me, it's like playground kind of, squabbling it i'm not we haven't got interested interest in that but i mean you've got some people that have made made a living from actually being known for doing this calling out stuff right that's what they do they've written books about it they call people out on stage and it's just like i say you know the, the main concern for me is the, the person trying to find the information i think you know th th there's enough people in the world right that need help with their weight enough people that need help with these problems they've got right for everyone to kind of stay in their lane a little bit and just provide a really good service and really good content. That, that's how I look at things anyway. That's great. Yeah, I like that, man. Stay clean yeah. of that. You don't need it. You can win without it, 100%. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you agree. <laughs> that's nice to hear. <laughs> so so from, from your side then, like, a, what's a week look like for you? Are you doing mainly consultation calls with your clients? Have you got, you know, live streams? How, how does a week look for you normally? Yeah, you know, formerly it was a lot of different client and sales calls, creating a lot of content, really trying to stay up and spending too much time creating for one medium. For example, on LinkedIn, if anyone's even lightly familiar with it, and they think back to all the content they saw in 2023, there was probably something called a carousel, meaning it's a PDF document, kind of like a, a boardroom presentation where you're clicking through multiple slides. And that was a huge thing in 2023. So for me back then, or at least last year back then, right? Uh, last year was a lot of those because they were driving a lot of engagement and then a lot of sales calls. And so time was a big constraint and doing that mixed in with a bunch of one-to-ones in terms of coaching, and you really don't have time for anything else. And so now I really started to transition to the group coaching side of it because I found a way that doesn't leave, it doesn't, it doesn't remove the efficacy of meeting with people and training them on a method that they can adapt for themselves so that they can get more leads and close more deals. So now I've got this model where I've got my time back. I have more time freedom, but I'm, I've also created this content engine in GPT four where I'm just clicking a button 
and content's coming out. And I still go in and edit it, of course, but I've been selling that in conjunction with coaching and in conjunction with this community and course of sorts to teach people the methods that I use to get to 50K and, and monthly coaching sales. And so now my weeks just look like creating content and building out different methods in which I can acquire leads and people into a funnel, but actually help them in the process. So they have a good taste in their mouth. If they don't buy from me, at least I help them do something. Yeah. Maybe they'll come back and buy later or, uh, you know, they just turn into a great connection to have and, and, and help grow, you know, by exchanging information, whatever it looks like. That's usually what my week looks like now. And, and I gotta tell you, I'm having so much fun, man. I'm enjoying it. I get a little burnt out sometimes because, uh, as a, as an individual, you're in your office all day. And while you're interacting with people behind screens, it's nice to go for a walk or it's nice <laughs> to go with my wife to a restaurant or maybe fly out and see some friends. So, um, but I'd rather have that problem than going to an office and being stuck in traffic and so on. And I say yeah. that even though I had a wonderful corporate career, I'm not bagging on the nine to five at all. I believe in the nine to five and I believe there are many people that we don't even hear of who are very happy with that. And I know I was happy with that as well. So, um, in any case, uh, I, mean, I don't mean to go off on a tangent there, but that's what my week looks like. And, and it's been great. What, what made you go from corporate to coaching? The opportunity to grow a business of my own on LinkedIn simply proved to be too great. So I had a wonderful nine to five career. I mean, you know, from working at the Googles of the world, some new startups that are exploring new items, challenging um, concepts. And, and I love the building and the chase and, and so on of doing that. I just took a dive on LinkedIn. I started posting content in April of 2022 thinking, well, I'm just going to do this to better connect with people in my industry. I didn't have an offer. I wasn't trying to sell anything. That wasn't my goal. Fast forward six months later and I said, okay, let me just see if I start doing some sales content. Are people like going to be interested in the service? And I did it and it worked and I'm thinking, oh crap, well now what do I do? <laughs> so all of a sudden I just turned into a ghost writer and I was producing really good content. So, um, that was my offer is like, I will create your content for you. And that wasn't my intention to go that way. I, that's just what I saw other people doing. So I said, okay, let me see if I can get them to bite and they bit. And then, you know, 20 days after kind of changing my sales approach, someone reached out and said, Hey, I'm interested in your service. I'm thinking, what, what service? What are you talking about, <laughs> right? Uh, so I had to create one from scratch, ended up closing a deal that was about 2K per month, and then close another and close another. And before you know it, I'm off to ghostwriting. But I didn't even like ghostwriting. I hate creating content for others. I'd rather just teach people how to create it themselves. Yeah. So you fast forward about a year after that, and I'm, I've now created this content engine that allows people to create their own content that sounds like them. It's targeted for their audience, completely customizable and helps them sell their offer. So it's been a journey, man, kind of one that I fell into accidentally and surprisingly. It's great that you, so you kind of, did you run your nine to five and that together? And there was a point where you said, right, this is now taken over or how did that look? Yeah. I stayed in my, my nine to five for six months after I closed that first, second, third, and even couple of deals. I just wanted to see, do I like this? Uh, do I want to transition? And even though I transitioned knowing that I didn't really like what I was doing, I still believe that I had got enough momentum, certainly had done a great job of building sustainable revenue, but got to a point where I said, okay, even though I don't like what I'm doing, I believe I can transition it. And I wasn't thinking that way at the time. You know, I just, I, I kind of fell into that further as well. So this big, huge exploration project turned into one pivot after the next. And as you often hear being an entrepreneur, what you think your business is today will not be what it is tomorrow. Yeah. And that's just safe to say that you're going to pivot and change and, um, Sometimes it's out of desperation. Sometimes it's out of opportunity. And sometimes it's just because what you originally thought was there isn't as opportunistic as you thought. So I've gone through the gamut of thinking, overthinking, questioning, should I go back to a nine to five? Should I stay here? Should yeah. I do all that? All of the things that race through your head, but it's out there. Like the answer to what you want to do is out there. And I landed on coaching because I think that's the greatest long-term opportunity because people will always buy knowledge. Hmm. And I suppose, you know, you'd probably have more of an insight into this than we do, but we've kind of got this 
whole thing around human first fitness. And the reason being is that we've seen a trend towards AI. And I actually speak to people and said, hey, I've got this new program written by ChatGPT. Da, 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 da. And for us, it's, you know, that human part, that coaching part, that element there is the bit that won't be able to be replaced by AI because you're not going to, I mean, you correct me if I'm wrong, but the empathy, the understanding of mood and energy and understanding when someone, you know, needs to be pushed, needs to be a little kind of a cuddle, needs to be kind of, you know, pushed a bit harder. So that, that bit for us, that human part is the bit that we really focus on because again, you know, times are changing faster than we can possibly imagine. And I think as you've kind of said, the coaching part, that human element is becoming more and more important as we go through the time. Yeah, definitely, man. I, you know, AI is, is a big part of everything. And I think all different types of coaches, service professionals, and so on are figuring out how do I integrate some element of yeah. AI, but, um, you know, rightfully so as you're thinking it is, it is going to be so important on the coaching front just to maintain the idea that you can help someone who's at place a and in between place a and place Z are all these obstacles. And for them to get to place Z of desired outcome, they're going to need new knowledge and they're going to need to be held accountable. They're going to need to be equipped, empowered. And oftentimes what I find, you probably see this too, Cameron, is it actually has more to do with their own kind of self-belief. You and I are not like life coaches or mindset coaches, but yet there's this element of mindset that actually comes into being a coach, no matter how specific it is. So if I'm helping people... <clears throat> excuse me, monetize their business on LinkedIn, but they don't believe that they can do it, even though I'm showing them the blueprint that, that gives them the exact steps that I almost have to pause and, and help them with their mindset first. So they can be enabled to take a process or protocol, adapt it, iterate it, launch it, fail with it a little bit until they kind of customize it to their own and then move forward. And I just see that time and time again, over and over. Yeah. So you're probably seeing that as well. Yeah, I mean, in, in our space, it would be, you know, um, uh, most of our clients are business leaders, people that are running companies, senior executives, and time's always a massive one. I don't have much time, I'm always traveling, I'm highly stressed. If I'm not working or traveling, I'm spending that time with my family. Where do I fit my personal health and fitness goals? You know, where do I fit in, you know, taking the first steps on that journey. And as you mentioned, it's a lot of mindset around what do you need to actually do to get things moving? Because what I often find is that people have this big, especially people that are successful, people that are very driven, they've got this kind of outlook, which is I should be Michael Jordan and I should run a company. And it's so kind of, for, for me, it's crazy because they're so driven. They Unless they can be the very best version of themselves, they're not interested. It's like, well, Let's just start at ground ground zero. Let's start with getting some steps in. Let's start with drinking some more water. Let's start with, okay, let's get you in the gym a couple of times a week. And once you get that momentum and that belief, sort of break down those beliefs around what they thought they needed to do, suddenly the ball starts rolling then. And then and that's where we enjoy seeing that person going from where they were to actually building that momentum, going, actually I can do this. It's possible, even when I don't have any time. Dude, you said it so well right there. I think let's think about that for a second. And we'll go back to the alphabet analogy I was just using. If A is their beginning point and Z is their ending point or their desired outcome, people are at the place of A, yet in their mindset, they want to start from the place of Y and be <laughs> so far skipped ahead that Z is coming tomorrow or sometime, you know, early Monday morning, the following week. <laughs> when in reality, it's just like what you said, if you're on step A, then just get to step B. And maybe that means taking a walk for 20 minutes a day and drinking some water, right? You drank three cups of water, uh, you know, on your regular basis. Well, getting to step B means you're gonna go for a walk for 20 minutes a day three days a week, and you're going to drink five cups of water instead of three. That's yep. it. Yeah. Get there for a week. And then step C is what? Now you're going to add one day of going to the gym and you're going to, you know, increase your water cup, water drinking to six cups a day. There you go. And then so on. And you'll see you get to LMNOP and you're way more advanced and you're way yep. more consistent too yep. with a more advanced system that has now become a sustainable 
breath of fresh air that was once dreaded and now is looked forward to. Yep. And man, I just think you nailed it with that. Uh, and I'm glad the alphabet thing kind of came in here. <laughs> yeah. and worked for us too and I'm really stealing that. that. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, what, what, what we also see, and you, maybe you're the same, is that, you know, you only know what you know. And when you're sitting in a situation where you're overwhelmed, you're sitting, looking at your diary saying, how do I get any exercise in? How do I look after my food? And once they get to the, you know, back to your analogy again, the B and the C, suddenly they can see the next part. But like you say, we call it headbutt in the horizon. They keep trying to headbutt the horizon as in I want to get their ASAP, which, you know, through coaching, you can facilitate them getting there much, much faster than they would on their own. And that's what we do, right? But it's taking them back a step and say, let's break this down and make it as simple as possible. So yeah, I'm going to steal your A to Z thing. <laughs> I like it. I've never said that before. So now I'm yeah. interested in figuring out how do I make a post out of this, right? The mind <laughs> of content, someone who's You're content. Content creators sitting there working out what he's going to uh, what he's going to make <laughs> yeah. make tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. so, so, so I think what will be interesting because you know a lot of our guys that follow us, a lot of people that follow us are business people. They might be CEO of a corporate, they might be a managing director, whatever you know. And um, you know, we see the I see the power of LinkedIn. You know, you definitely see the power of LinkedIn. And what I've started to see as well is more. CEOs, more business owners starting to kind of create their own personal brand, right? And start to talk more on LinkedIn, start to share more content. If you're, if you were, you know, a CEO watching this or someone that's in corporate, what, what do you think, you know, back to the ABC thing, right? Where do you think is a great place to start if you don't know where to start with your LinkedIn content and what would be, you know, what would make the most sense if you're just getting started on that journey? Yeah. I start by posting three times a week. Just, just lean into what you know as an expert, whether you're fresh out of college or whether you're a, you know, a CEO at, at 50 years old, right? Just start posting content relative to the audience you're interested in and the skill set you provide to that audience. It doesn't even mean you need to sell anything. So let's take an example, right? If I were fresh out of college and I'm now you know, a social media uh, consultant, or I'm sorry, a social media specialist at a company, I just got hired, brand new entry level, but I've been creating social media on the side, which is why I went to that career. It's why I got my degree and so on. Um, start building that company brand. Yes, but build what you know about testing in the wild on social media on the side, even if that means you just posting a few times a week, right? Or let's pretend you're, you never post on social media, you're fresh out of college and you've got a sales role, right? So you're an entry level salesperson. Post content about sales practices that you're learning. Sorry, Siri is, Siri thinks <laughs> that I'm talking to her and uh, she's not a part of the podcast. If you're, you're a salesperson, for example, you can post about how you're learning to be a sales professional and people love following build in public journeys. So you're now following this young sales professional and let's pretend she's, you know, she's nervous and, and she's getting up the courage to post about new sales stuff she's learning and people are kind of rooting with her along the way, you'll find that all over LinkedIn. It's a very positive place. Unlike yep. Twitter or someone else, right? There's, there's not that toxicity here, at least in my experience. Yeah. But then, then you're making a post about, Hey, you closed your first deal and so on. Right? So you're going to build that audience and that trust. And maybe in your career, as you progress, you decide I'm going to leave the corporate world and be my own sales coach. And people will already have an affinity with you and will want to buy your coaching because they saw how you did it from a to effectively Z. Um, or if you're an experienced career, share your knowledge. Uh, I mean, it, just share your knowledge. What have you learned as a CEO, right? Failures, triumphs, all the restructuring trends. I mean, there's just no shortage of topics to talk about. Yeah. Take a poke at it. If that means once a week instead of three, fine, but get comfortable with the idea of posting. And you may think to yourself, I have no idea what I would post about. Well, welcome to the club. Neither did anyone else when they started posting. That clarity will come to you after you get started. Yep. So embrace the ambiguity. It's a great place on LinkedIn to do this. People are doing that every day and winning. I knew of a guy that like, and we'll go with like the, if they were selling a service route, he had 1800 followers when he was making 20 grand a month and you'll never guess what he was doing, but I'll just tell you straight up here. He was 
booking virtual dental appointments for local dentists. That's it. So like he was kind of doing lead gen for them. <sighs> Talk about a niche, right? Local virtual dental appointments, 1800 followers, 20 grand a month. Wow. There's something for everyone out there. I think you, you, you made a great point about LinkedIn. I mean, I kind of alluded to it earlier, you know, the, the TikTok, the Instagram, and I'll comment on this specifically as someone that's in the health and fitness space. It, it is, and I did, you know, we've, we've been on TikTok for a little while. It, it can be a very toxic place. It can be a place, well, no, it's not that it can be. It is a place where people will comment on your post and probably say something negative, right? But my experience with LinkedIn is that you don't get that. If you do get it, I've had it a couple of times, but, you know, mainly people that <clears throat> it's more about them than it is about you, right? But generally LinkedIn is a very supportive place. Business people are supportive of each other. I've had people, you know, like yourself reach out and kind of, just have conversations and be open to that. So I think if you're in the business space, it links it makes a lot of sense. With your guys that you kind of coach, do you have them just work on LinkedIn or across all platforms or does it depend? It's a great question. And it really just depends on where you're at in your journey. My first recommendation is if you're just starting out, only focus on one platform. Get to know that platform inside and out, master it, build an audience to the degree where if you are trying to do this full time, that you've built such a strong audience on the platform that people are buying your product consistently. Like get to seven to 10 K in revenue per month consistently, then consider scaling to another platform to help with that sales process. Just know you're gonna have to repeat the same process. Mm -hmm. yeah. So don't expect to get to 10 K a month on LinkedIn and then think I'm gonna go to YouTube now and do that. And then instantly I have 10 K a month. You're gonna go through the same building process. And you're going to be able to do it faster because you're more knowledgeable, but it doesn't mean like rapid faster, right? Unless you get lucky and just start all your videos start hitting or so on. Yeah. So just keep that in mind. I've tried that so many times thinking, oh, I've mastered LinkedIn. Now I'm ready to do Instagram and, and YouTube at the same time. And it was a fit and a start and that's it. And yeah. um, I, now I just have dead accounts there and I'm, I'm realizing, okay, for me to win on YouTube, a place that I want to win on, I'm going to have to get a consultant, another service provider who's just like me. And so I recently yeah. found that person now and they're going to manage my channel for me. All I have to do is show up and um, get the videos done. So, you, you know, you're going to have to face those challenges as you build scale and, and grow. But first and foremost, just master one platform. Yeah, get an audience, settle that audience consistently, then make the decision and know it's not going to all happen at once. Where do you sit? I mean, it's kind of brought a question to, to the front of mind for me is that where do you sit on the repurposing ideology, which I, I kind of, you know, I hear this a lot. You know, if you produce one video, you can chop it, you can put it on Instagram, you can put it on TikTok and kind of based on what you've just said and also in my experience as well, by the way, um, I find sometimes it kind of waters down what the message was in the first place sometimes and sometimes in my experience, I can't comment for everybody, but I feel like you've kind of watered down your message a little bit and you've crowbarred that into another platform where actually what you maybe should have done is to make it really suitable for the, the platform you were trying to use originally and just focus on that one. How, how do you, where, where do you sit on that? Yeah, I, one, I agree with you. And, and just to play both sides here, there's a way to get it right and obviously a way to get it wrong. Yeah. So uh, I, I see it work really well, and I see other times where it doesn't work well. Here's one example, or maybe a few examples of where it works well. You have a post, and it does really well, right? You know, two months go by. Take that same post, and you can either change some things, change the topic, but use the same framework, the same idea, and you're just using it for a similar and relevant topic for your audience, and post it again. And maybe this time you had a picture or maybe yeah. you take that original post and you turn it into a video and you use it as a video script. One, your audience isn't going to remember, even if they deeply engage with it the first time, yeah. you just have to access to too much information. So repetition through reposting of proven content is great for repurposing. But in the wrong sense, if you were to take a video, and you didn't go deep enough into the topic, even though it was a you know, five to 10 minute video. And then you try to take some concepts from that video, some clips per se, 
and then you go and post them, but it doesn't get to the point that you made through that 10 minute video, then I think what you're doing is just like you said, you're watering down your content. You're actually causing confusion yeah. instead of driving clarity. So I think there's a time and place for everyone to really evaluate is what I posted two months ago, or is what I'm posting now able to have multiple sections that could stand alone. One more example. I just wrote a 26 page ebook about how I went from 5k to 50k a month in coaching sales. There's three different components in that book, creating your dynamic offer, the content you use to promote that offer and the sales process you use to sell that offer. Each one of those sections can be its kind of own little mini guide of sorts. So I could take each one of those sections and develop a couple of pieces of content because on their own, each section can get someone to take immediate action in a way where they can understand the full idea of the concept, such as like content marketing and implement it for themselves. But I wouldn't do that if they could take the content marketing section and it's only enough to kind of like make them think about it, but not really know what action to take. And so I would be doing my audience and new audiences and myself a disservice if I posted content like that, because I would get them to read it, but not understand it to the degree that they take action. And when you get someone to understand a perspective so much so that they're motivated and actually take the action, you will build buyer trust. And that's when people start asking about your service because you've won their perspective. You've built trust. Now you're, you're known, you're liked, you're trusted. And when you do that right through good content, that's when it really turns on. So it kind of goes back to that methodology of <clears throat> give your best stuff for free, right? If you give your best stuff out for free, that attracts people to what you do, right? Yeah. And just to touch on that real quick, because sometimes people think, well, I'm going to give everything away for free. <laughs> um, I actually don't agree with that. I know Alex Hermosi says that a lot, but he's at a much different stage in his journey. Yeah. And so really like there's a certain amount of what you give away for free and it's different for everyone depending on where you're at. So I wish I could say like, here's the blueprint for doing that, but you really have to evaluate what that is. Um, and here's a good example. If you're a copywriter, for example, teach people the secret to writing better all day, right? Here's how not to write a CTA. Here's how to write a CTA. Here's not how to write a post. Here's how to write a post. Here's a template. So you can fill in the blank, all that stuff, give away for free yeah. because the people you're going to target, the reason they're going to buy from you as a copywriter is because even though they have all these resources and all this knowledge, they probably don't have the time to do it themselves, even though they could. Yeah. Even though they could learn it and implement it, they just don't have the time. So they're going to hire you for the implementation that you provide. Yeah. So it's, it's those things where you kind of have to just you, you, sometimes it's good to have a coach to walk you through that. Who's gone through that. I used to give away everything for free and it was, I was giving away way too much. And I had my <laughs> business coach say no more of that. And yeah. Said, no stop. No more that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we've, um, it's, it's really interesting actually, because you know, again, I'm commenting on my space, my industry, right? And because what I've found, especially over the last kind of five years, is because the information that has become, you know, so muddied, so confusing for people, when people come to us as a company and they kind of check our content and look at our five-step process, trying to understand how we work, right? They're kind of confused because they may have seen something you know, some dude on Instagram or some girl on Instagram telling them all they need to do is eat less and move more. Okay. Which is such an oversimplification of what it takes to actually get in great shape. It's, it pisses me off a little bit because it's kind of like you're underselling what you're doing here. Okay. So if you imagine you've got a business leader, 50 years of age, they're in terrible shape, you know, their bloods are all over the place. Their blood pressure's through the roof. They're taking all these medications. You know, their bodies aches, they're inflamed, they're bloated, they hardly sleep, they drink all the time and eat crap all the time. And that person reads this guy's post and says, all I've got to do is move more and eat less. I'm, I hate to break it to you, but they're going to take a lot longer, longer to do what you want than just move more. And how I kind of describe it is that when you're trying to help that individual, they're the Titanic, right? And they're careering towards this iceberg, which is poor health, 
the doc saying you need to lose weight if you've got a heart problem and for them to then read you know oh well i've only got to move more and eat less okay they get deluded around what's going to work and they're sitting in the front of the titanic and they get their tiny little oar out they stick it in the water and nothing happens and they've wasted six months of messing around eating less and moving more so i suppose you know what you're saying about you know give that implement give that information out show the process but then pay for the implementation which essentially is what we're doing here i found in my space that it's become so confusing for people that they're just kind of a little deluded around what will actually work for them and what often we find is they have to kind of go through this process of i'm going to eat less and move more try 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 nothing happens and they go okay maybe they were right that there's going to have to be a little bit more kind of effort and advice around what i need to do so um yeah i don't know if you've got any comment on that but that's been my experience within within our space yeah i mean let's let's just break that down for a second right eat less move more well, what are you eating is a question that gets begotten from the original question. So if you're eating less, but you're still at McDonald's and other fast food restaurants every day, yeah. you eating less may actually mean eating more because the calorie count could be so high and have all of those different bad chemicals in there that you're actually just poisoning your body with every meal. Yeah. And then if move more means hey, I'm going out and I'm doing long distance running when in reality, you actually should be lifting weights because that's what helps you really build muscle, lose fat. Whereas when you're running, you're just burning carbs, but not fat. Well, <laughs> now you've actually compounded the issue even further because you're eating a ton of fatty foods that are getting stored along with the carbs, but you're also doing the wrong exercise. And yeah, I mean, there's some benefit to it, sure but you're not going to lose the weight that you think you're going to lose. You're going to lose some and it's going to get, it's going to be a mirage and yep. you're going to think that what you're doing is working and really what you're doing is just poisoning yourself while doing the wrong exercise. You're wasting your time and your money. Then you're going to have to jump from one health course to the next. And before you know it, you're reaching out to Cameron saying, what happened here? <laughs> Someone said I could eat less and move more. You know? and, so, and, and now I'm still hiring another coach. I hope this yeah. is the last one. So it's, it's funny yeah. how that works out. Yeah, I mean, we use the analogy all the time, you know, it's kind of, you know, if you are in your 50s and you're you're in that that kind of that person I described is maybe like you and you've never checked in with your health for the last 30 years, right? So I have in a car, you buy a car and you never service it, you never get it checked, you never get the brakes replaced and then you take it to the garage 20 years down the line, they say it's going to cost you $5,000, $10,000 to get it fixed. They go, well, why is it so expensive? It's well, because for 20 years, you've not invested at all. And now your bill's gone up and up and up. And it kind of, it kind of, it does sometimes shock people that, you know, this is a project here. This is not a quick fix. This is going to take a little time. And I think it's just, you know, something that we try to communicate to that type of person is that, you know, it can be done. It, it is possible, but you're probably not going to find the, the, you're not going to find the, the solution on YouTube by watching hours of people that tell you to eat less and, move more right but anyway i've banged that drum for long enough you, you get where i'm coming from <laughs> oh i know exactly what you mean man yeah. yeah just just quickly then kind of to um move this a little bit more into the the kind of health side of things i i saw from your comment there the, your response to that statement i made clearly you're someone that knows a bit about food and training and stuff like that so for yourself then you know someone that's that's busy that's kind of sitting down a lot that's reasonably you know, in this Zoom kind of world. What do you do to keep your, your head clear? What do you do to keep yourself moving and feeling good in your own skin, really? Yeah, my wife and I have a home gym at this point that we use, and then um, we also just go for walks. Uh, people are, uh, you know, you could probably speak to this way deeper than I can, but going for a walk for 20 to 30 minutes a day is just a great way, easy, low-hanging fruit to help build towards health. Is it the only thing you should do? No, I don't think so. Um, I think there's huge benefit to at least being at the gym a few times a week with either the high intensity interval training and weights. Um, yeah. I still believe weightlifting <clears throat> recommend this. My deep conviction is that is the most important health exercise because it's burning fat and building muscle at the same time. And um, I think there's enough studies out there that have shown that you are build or burning calories longer after those types of intense workouts. It doesn't mean you need to be a bodybuilder. 
Doesn't mean you need to be ripped. Doesn't mean you need to get to a six pack. You don't even need to make those goals. Just just get in there for 30 minutes to an hour and and build up a sweat, build up some momentum. And we always feel so much better when we do that, right? Like, oh yeah. man, I don't want to go to the gym. But after the gym, what do you say? I'm so glad I went. So doing those things um, have been have been helpful. I've, I've I just anytime I do that, it's always a I'm so glad I did that versus a I wish I didn't do that. Many yeah, people are not going to say that unless you injure yourself because you didn't hire a Cameron to. to help. <laughs> yeah, I mean the, the, the strength element. I did a, a, an audio on this yesterday. Is the most underrated um, kind of element of health and fitness, without a doubt. Being strong has nothing but upside. And I think you know I, I can't comment on on the US, but over here there's a culture of get your trainers on and go for a run which is great because it's free. It takes very minimal effort. You've got a street in front of your house. It's easy. You can do it in the morning. It's not obtrusive around your time. The issue you've got is that if you're carrying 14 pound, 28 pound, 40 pound, 50 pound, you should not be running at all because you're going to hurt yourself. And what people don't realize is that, yes, it's great. It's great. There's apps out there. We've got a couch to 5k thing here. It's great, but the walking element is much safer. It, you're not going to hurt yourself. It's great to get some air inside your lungs. And the thing is, when we're dealing with people that are, you know, chained to Zoom or stuck in an office, you can implement that into your day quite easy. You can put your earphones in. You can have a team meeting. You can walk around the park. You can speak to a friend. You can grab a coffee. It's an easy thing to implement into your day, and it makes you feel really good. Yeah. And I think you, you've hit the nail on the head. I think walking is a great place to start for everybody because even if you are you haven't got weight to lose and you're reasonably healthy it's just great for your mind right just to yeah. clear your head as well agreed man agreed absolutely so just quickly then before we kind of um wrap up today where can people check you out where's the best place to learn a bit more about what you do i've mentioned linkedin so i guess that's the best place yeah linkedin is the best place uh i post there mm. at least monday through friday sometimes on the weekends but um LinkedIn is kind of my office, right? So I'm there all the time. It's, that's how you and I got connected, right? That's that's why I'm on this podcast here today. So find me on LinkedIn. Just search for Ryan Musselman. I, I think I might be one of the only ones there. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you are. Picture, yeah. so you'll, you'll see. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Well, I appreciate your time. Appreciate you sharing a bit about your journey. And um, like I say, it'd be great to, um, if, you, if you're thinking about getting a coach on board that can help with your content, you've got to reach out to Ryan. And if you're a CEO, if you're a business leader, like I just mentioned, you want to get in shape, don't just think about moving more and eating less. You can come and come speak to an expert. <laughs> yeah. Cheers, Ryan. Nice Thank you. you too, Cameron, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me, dude. Great speaking with you. Great job. Thank you.